right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time ever joining us, a huge welcome. Uh, of course, uh, another welcome to all of our familiar faces who join us uh, every month as we bring scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists live into classrooms across North America. We have a ton of events still coming up this month, so do take a few moments and visit Exploring by the Seat. Dot com. You can pop that up there. You can find all the events that are coming up and we will be announcing our April events really soon. A whole large drop of events coming up uh, for classrooms to join across North America. We have a great event coming up today. I'm so excited to have Dr. James Raffin joining us today. He is a writer, a teacher, a geographer, and an adventurer. He's written more than 20 books, including Circling the Midnight Sun, uh, Emperor of the North and Summer North of 60. But before he began that life of writing and exploration, he started his academic career studying polar bear vision. So since that time, he has spent over 40 years learning from polar bears in the wild, but also from the Northern people who know them the best. His recent book, Ice Walker, takes us on a journey into the world of polar bear behavior, anatomy, physiology, to ponder a really important question that we're gonna dive into, I think, a little bit today. Why do polar bears have those long noses? So I'm gonna bring James in live with us right now. Here we go. Hey, James, how you doing? Hey, Joel, I didn't realize this was a rock and roll show. I've just finished dancing here in my grandson's bedroom. <clears throat> Well, that was kind of the opening act and you're the headliner now, James. So uh, it's much. great to have you joining us live Hi, today. Everybody. Yeah, we've got a <laughs> great group of classrooms, James. I was telling you yesterday, over 50 classrooms, either on camera spots or tuning in live with us right now from uh, different places across Canada and the US who are really excited to dive into that polar bear world with you. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. I'm gonna tuck myself away. The stage is yours. Ladies, and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm especially delighted to be with Joe and an organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, because that's what I've been doing for most of my life. And the best thing about learning through the seat of your pants, through the palms of your hands, through the soles of your feet, is that the information, the knowledge that comes in there actually has to pass through your heart before it gets to your CPU, it gets to your brain. And I think that's a very special kind of knowledge. So today uh, I wanna say a word or two about, or try to answer the question for you. And then uh, just to sort of sow the seed of questions, why do polar bears have long noses? Maybe you didn't know polar bears have long noses. Now, I bet you actually know quite a few polar bears because polar bear images are used to sell almost everything under the sun from underwear to cars to chocolate bars to conservation to uh soda pop to uh, it doesn't really matter so i i bet that you have met polar bears and some of you may actually have had your favorite coke product out of a can with polar bears on them coke in particular has used the polar bear quite extensively to uh, to move their products. And uh, why is that? Well, that's a charismatic large mammal, a large, beautiful mammal that kind of catches your eye. It doesn't matter whether you live in Florida or Anchorage, Inuvik or Istanbul, polar bears seem to catch people's eye. And uh, that's good in a way. But uh, as a person who began um, studying polar bears uh, scientifically, I know that uh, it's a rather more complicated story and more interesting story than just uh, something that's big and beautiful. And in fact, I have, as Joe, Joe suggested, hung out with a few polar bears in my day. Um, but I want to begin, begin by just uh suggesting well i mean it adds, do polar bears have long noses or you might have said well yeah but compared to what and uh i want to say that the family ursidae which is the family in which polar bears are situated includes a black bear or ursus uh, americanus and it has a a nose about that long um its bigger cousin <clears throat> uh ursus arctos the brown bear uh, has an even long, a little bit longer nose, and uh, the subspecies are the uh, the well. It's another kind of brown bear uh, that is found uh, 
uh, inland is uh, is a grizzly bear and uh, bear and land grizzlies. They well, they they can have a longer nose than a brown bear, and then polar bears have the longest nose of all. So when I'm saying why do polar bears have long noses? I mean, they're longer than ours, yours and mine, but they're also longer than all of their uh, Ursidae uh, cousins. So uh, polar bears are bears of the ice, and uh, it's a really kind of an interesting evolutionary story. Polar bears were brown bears, perhaps 250,000, maybe older, more years ago, when for reasons that we're still ex exploring, um, they left the land, maybe in Siberia, and bears that were lighter in color did better on the ice, um, and bears that were a little bit bigger did better on the ice. Bears that could eat just fat did better on the ice. But uh, I want to just set the scene of this story, if you like, by showing you this image. Now, you may be thinking, what on earth is that? Well, what you just saw was an animation of the top of the earth showing the minimum amount of ice in the summer, which actually, if you were to look at it again, and I'm not going to do that just for reasons of time, you may recognize Greenland, the big uh, island at the top of the earth there. But one of the reasons why polar bears are really not well as well understood as they could be is that they're on the top of the earth. And if you may know, if you've got a map in your classroom, quite often the north and south poles are cut off the maps. But that's where polar bears live. And as climate change has been going on in this period we're calling the Anthropocene or the Anthropocene, this is like a, a whole age where our impact as people are affecting the earth. And one of the effects through global warming is the disappearing of northern sea ice. And for polar bears, golly, that's a problem because this is a bear of the ice and the ice is disappearing. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, big, a big issue. Now, how many polar bears are there out there? Well, those of us who have studied polar bears know that they tend to be in groups in the northern hemisphere. There are no polar bears in South Africa or South Africa. No, there aren't any polar bears in South Africa, in uh, Antarctica. They're only, so if you ever see a picture of a penguin and a polar bear together, that's a, a figment of some art director's imagination. But if this is looking again at the northern hemisphere, the top of the earth, there are about 19 polar bear populations that have been identified. And I don't know if you know how many people are in the village or town or city where you live, but the village of polar bears, which has 19 sort of sub neighborhoods, if you like, uh, includes between 20 and 30,000 polar bears. So they're, it's a, uh, it's not a huge number of bears on, on the earth. And most of those bears in one way or another are threatened because of changing circumstances that human climate change have brought. So uh, I have met polar bears in Russia. I have met polar bears in Greenland. I have met bear, bears in a lot of different places in the circumpolar world. They're very adaptable. Uh, but they need ice. They need ice to survive. And why is that? Well, uh, they need ice to survive because that's where their principal food source is. And I actually met my first polar bear face to face, who was a 350 kilogram uh, male polar bear called Huxley at the University of Guelph. And that's me in a cage with a uh, veterinary anesthetist uh, who called Wayne McDonnell, who had given me a, a, a sedatives to put in a dart to youth, or, uh, anesthetize Huxley so we could take blood. And there's a lab tech, my friend Jan is there as well uh, with different types of containers. And I'm taking blood from this bear to see how he's doing. But that's where I began my, my life as a biologist. But it was in the wild and through that process that in my life, I have really got interested in polar bears and what they're doing and how they live their lives. And that's what I want to say a word to you. They are an amazing, amazing animal. Now, this might seem a little bit off the wall, but I want you to reflect on the last time you had a campfire and cooked us some more. OK, so you're cooking your your. Uh, your marshmallow and you put it with chocolate and crack graham cracker and you eat it it's sweet and delicious well 
what is the, the combustion equation for the campfire you cook that on? Well, you need wood and fuel. You add oxygen from the air and a spark. And what does that produce? It produces carbon dioxide, water, and energy, and then light heat coming out of that. Well, one of the most amazing things about a polar bear is that they are able to live in an environment, a largely frozen environment where there's no fresh water. That's all salty sea there. The ice itself is fresh, but uh, you know what trying to get a quench your thirst for the snowball is like. You lose heat so quickly that it's really not worth the effort. But um, polar bears, you, you think, well, if there's no other way out on the ice, how is it that they get enough to drink and enough water for them to do what they need to do as an organism? And the answer is they have a combustion equation too. Their principal food is fat. And the reason why that is, is that it's full of energy, which when combined with oxygen from their breathing through their nose, produces carbon dioxide, which they breathe out, and water. And that water, so-called metabolic water, is what they need. They can live for months on end without drinking. Amazing, amazing creature. And of course, that uh, combustion equation of the polar bear produces energy, which allows them to keep a, an internal temperature that even when it's really, really cold outside, that is the same as ours, 37 degrees C or 98.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I don't care what piece of the polar bear you might want to look at from tip to their feet to the tip of their nose, uh, their feet uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about polar bears, but I want to get to the nose. But before I get to the nose, I just want to say that living in an environment like this that is really kind of the same, it's undifferentiated. There are no trails on ice. Uh, it's frozen. It's not like in the depth of the equatorial rainforest. It's a very particular type of environment, very harsh environment, and bears are completely suited to it. And in fact, uh, their feet, I mean, I could just as easily tell you about their feet. I'm not going to do that. I just want to say that their feet are amazing too. Can you imagine walking on the ice in your bare feet? So on the ice, let's say it's minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit or centigrade. It doesn't really matter because they're getting about the same then. And inside your body is 37 or 98.6. And in the little bit of the skin of your foot, there's a transition of over 60 degrees and polar bears just, they're able to do that without any trouble at all. And uh, I think that's amazing, but I wanna get to, well, why does a polar bear need a good nose? Cause they need to eat. And that's because there it's dark most of the time. It's getting a little bit lighter now on the ice of the far north as the uh, as spring comes along. But this is their main food source, seals. And in order to find seals, if you're hunting them in the dark, you have to be able to smell them. So getting to the big question of the day here, there's a polar bear nose. It's about nine inches long on a, on a big adult polar bear. And of course, inside the polar bear, it's warm. Outside, it's cold. And one of the reasons why a polar bear has a long nose 23 centimeters, nine inches, uh, for those of you who are on the metric or the British system or American system, in that nine inches, in that 23 centimeters, when the polar bear breathes, they're breathing in air that is super cold and super dry. And by the time it gets into the animal, it has to be warm and moist. Otherwise, it will cause problems inside the bear. And why is that nose? long one of the adaptations is that it's actually a heat exchanger for the bear so if you were to walk up and <sighs> bad breath bear right close and look straight up its nostrils look right in the bear what you would find are sinuses get holes in their head the same as we have but in those are all kinds of pathways with a ton of surface area called nasal turbinates that um, allow air to be warmed and moistened as the, um, as the bear is breathing. And likewise, when the bear is breathing out, the turbinates, that whole area, they're able to reclaim some of the moisture that they have put into the air because 
that is another way that they uh, they can conserve conserve water as they go along. But the other thing about all of that surface area inside their nose, it gives them the most amazing sniffer in the animal world. And to give you an idea of how good polar bear smell ability to smell is, here we are, you put a flower in front of your nose and you smell that. Just imagine that for a second. And I'm sure you've all had, whether it's a dandelion from your lawn or a flower in an arrangement, there's a rose, you smell that. That's reminded me to be uh, very quick here and I will be. If that's what we smell, our dog, your regular run of the mill house dog, smells about a hundred times better or can pick up a scent a hundred times fainter than we can smell. A really good smelling dog like a bloodhound can do about 300 times, smell about 300 times better. A polar bear can smell anywhere from four to seven times better than even a bloodhound, which is 2,100 times better or 2,100 times fainter smell. And uh, scientists are actually mapping smells. <laughs> that's, a, that's a map, if you can believe it, of the smells in Edinburgh, Scotland, from fish and chips to uh, rotten garbage or whatever. But polar bears, if you can imagine, they're on this flat ice, but they actually are living in a scape, a smellscape, because their, their, their smell is, our ability to smell is so, is so great. And uh, in fact, in the place where they live, they not only can smell all sorts of things, including, uh, you know, uh, uh, smoke from smelters in, in the southern U.S. to, well, all of the other things that we put into the air from toxic chemicals to heavy metals to pesticides. And uh, that's a good thing for the bear that they can smell all that, but it's also a bad thing to the, uh, for the bear because of the, the, uh, those kinds of things building up in their bodies. But the nose is what engages them with that. So I'm glad you're on this call uh, on this because uh, that same image of the pair going, oh my goodness, the, light, the ice is all disappearing. That's been actually used by my friends at the Russian Geographical Society. And it says on the bottom in Russian, think about it. I think a polar bear, because we're so attracted to them, because advertising has shown us we're really fascinated with them, this is a good way in to start thinking about it. And in fact, in my book, Ice Walker, which is available as, a, as an ebook, it's available as an audio book, it's available in English, French, um, it, asks, it actually is a portrait of humanity in uh, about three years in the life of a female polar bear in southwestern Hudson Bay. And I just put up my some of my contact info because if you would like to follow up on this, I would be delighted to do that. But meanwhile, uh, Joe, I'm going to say uh, I can't wait. And I bet there are questions here that I'm not going to be able to answer. And um, yeah, that's about um, that's about all I have to say for now. Back to you, Joe. All right, James. Well, thank you for taking us uh, on that little trip into the polar bear world. While you were presenting, I pulled together a little Kahoot quiz behind the scenes. So we're going to give the students a chance to test their knowledge uh, and see how well they were paying attention. They get to compete against each other. So I'm going to share a link right now. If you are in your classroom or joining from home, here is the link you need, kahoot.it. And then it's going to ask you for a PIN number. And lucky for you, I have uh, that PIN number handy. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Um, and then a reminder that if you are one-to-one -one device at your desk, that's awesome. You can join there. If you don't have that, your teacher can bring it up at the front of the room. You can shout out your answers to him or her. So here we go. I am going to share my screen coming up now. And then I'm going to jump over and pick the right Kahoot window. There we go. So here's our PIN number for today, 280-4396. I'll give a few, a minute or so uh, to get some classrooms coming in and joining us. I'll tell you a little bit about the questions. There is a little bit of true and false and multiple choice. Um, if you get the answer right, of course, you're going to get some points. Uh, if you get the answer right and you do it quickly, you get even more points. The quicker that answer comes in, the more points you're going to get. However, if you get the answer wrong, but you do it really fast, well, we still got nothing for you. You got to get that answer right uh, and then get those points. So James, we already shot up over 50 students. Lots of students are joining into the quiz right now. We'll give it 
oh, it's coming really fast. So we're going to have to give it another minute to let them all get in and settled. Um, and then we're going to take the quiz live, James. We'll see who comes out on top and maybe the classroom. If you're a camera classroom or you're on the YouTube chat, let us know which classroom, who the student was in, who came out uh, on top today. So over 100 students joined in already. We'll give it, well, it's not slowing down. So we're going to have to give it another, maybe 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And then we're going to take the quiz live. Uh, and then after that, we will take, oh, we'll take over with questions. We'll let James answer some questions for us and see if uh, any of those questions stump him like he was predicting. We'll see. Okay, here we go. Question one coming up. What do we call the time of humans? Was it the Pliocene, the Holocene, the Anthropocene, or the Miocene? What do we call the time of humans? What time period? All of those listed there are real time periods throughout the history of our planet, but one of them is correct. All right, good job. Couldn't fool this crew. Most students went with uh, the Anthropocene. Very good. Let's jump over and see who's in the lead. The Giving Puffin is in the lead. Let's see what happens in our next question. Question two, how many polar bear populations have been identified? Was it 10, 26, 19, or 42? How many different populations uh, of polar bears have been identified? A couple seconds left. Oh, we fooled them with that one. Um, yeah, most went with 26. It's 19. 19 uh, have been... Oh, no, this uh, this looks like it might be my fault. I think I clicked the wrong answer. 19. <laughs> so anybody who picked 19, look, most went 19, James. Uh, good stuff. That's what happens when you make the quizzes on the fly sometimes. But that was absolutely the right answer. So uh, a shout out to those who got that correct and not to my uh clumsy finger wise wolf has taken the lead but we're gonna put an asterisk next to that because uh yeah that question answer wasn't quite right so true and false polar bears can live for several months without drinking fresh water was that true uh, or was that false out on that sea ice looking for something to eat All right, sharp students paying attention. I clicked the right spot this time. That is true. Uh, very cool. Let's see what that does to our leaderboard. The Giving Puffin comes back into the lead. Now I'm going to give you a little heads up on this next question. I was a little sneaky with this next question. So let's see uh, if I catch anyone. Here we go. Polar bear's main food source. What is it? Is it fish? Is it penguins? Is it muskox? Uh, or is it seals? What is the polar bear's main food source? We have five more seconds to get that answer in. So cool to see so many students playing along with us today. Uh, I didn't fool very many. Most went with seals. I put a picture of a penguin to see if I'd catch anyone. Uh, but good job, everybody. We know that they're in different polar regions of the planet. We have one last question to wrap us up. The Giving Puffin is holding the lead. Our final question, how much better can polar bear smell than us? Was it a thousand times, 2,100 times, a hundred times, or 50 times? Got a <laughs> nice look at the mug there looking at us. All right. Wow. Students are on the ball. I believe uh, James did say 2,100 times. Good job, crew. Uh, let us shake down that podium and see who, who's coming out on top. In third place, we had the dynamic raccoon. In second place, we had the green badger. And number one was the giving puff and held on to that top spot. Awesome stuff. Good job, everybody. Uh, and thanks so much for playing along with us today. All right, James, what do you say? Let's get into some Q&A action. Right on. 
So let's go to our first live classroom. Uh, if you're tuning in on YouTube, use that chat sidebar. Of course, let us know where you're tuning in from uh, and then pile in some of those questions. But for now, why don't we start off with, let's go to Miss Checklex Crew. They are sixth graders joining us. I am going to bring them in live right now. Here they come. Are we doing grade six? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going right away. Oh, yay! Do we have any questions? We have a question. Go, Gabby. All right, come on up. She said, come on up so he can hear you. You asked. Don't be shy. This is Gabby. She got first place on the computer. How much is the polar bear weigh? All right, Gabby. She said, how much does the polar bear weigh? The polar bear would weigh... Uh, uh, small they they're born they weigh about a kilogram and uh, an adult female uh might weigh uh 200 kilograms four or five hundred pounds in that range and an adult bear would be about a third bigger than that so a really big polar bear male would weigh uh, maybe 500 kilograms a little bit more interestingly uh the amount of uh fat on a bear on the back of a bear is an indication of how well they they did because the thing you need to know about polar bear weight is that they only eat in the winter when they are on the ice in the summer when they are on the land they don't eat at all because there's no source of fat they might scavenge a bit and get some eggs and that kind of thing so in point of fact Every single bear, uh, successful bear, has a, a weight that swings quite a bit. Big in the winter, small in the summer. And one of the things about the disappearing ice is that imagine if you were able to eat for eight months of the year on the ice when it's frozen, and then that would last you for four months of summer when you can't eat. That's one thing. But imagine if the time on the ice was reduced from, say, eight months to six months, you wouldn't you would you would have longer time when you wouldn't eat and a shorter time when you could eat so that's a great question but um they are uh the biggest uh of the bear uh, of the ursidae family all right great question that's that's such a great way to put it james when you're grabbing all your food during a certain point of time but that point of time is getting shorter and shorter and you're having to stretch longer and longer before um you know enough sea ice returns to get back out there Miss Deacon's crew is tuning in with us from London, Ontario. How are we doing today, grade sevens? Hi, Miss Deacon. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this to us, Joe and uh, Dr. Dr. Raffin. Is that right? Thanks for bringing this to us. Uh, who knew there was so much to learn about a polar bear's nose? Like, really, right? Um, okay, so my class, uh, we're a virtual classroom, so I'm reading their questions to you. Um, so we've got a bunch of different questions, uh, some about you, uh, what inspired you to become a biologist, and why why polar bears? Um, and then what's your favorite kind of memory and experience with a polar bear? And have you ever been like scared with something uh, dangerous happen to you? So I've got some other ones, but um, let's start Let's start there and we can come back for round two. <laughs> okay, Ms. Deacon, you may, you may have to help me along. So the first question was what, what got me involved in the first place. Um, I think it was probably stuff that I read. We didn't have a TV when I was growing up. And uh, so I had a kind of steady diet of, uh, of books, animal books, uh, books about the North, books about exploration, and uh, uh, books like um, Jules Verne, Englishman at the North Pole. And uh, that that's what got me inspired. Interestingly, I wanted to be a, a, marine, a marine biologist from the time I was really, really little. And I ended up in that cage with the bear at the University of Guelph. And one of the things I realized is that I did not have the stomach to hold a big, beautiful bear like that in a cage. And as a result, my lifetime dream of being a marine biologist kind of got set aside to actually go to the bears, go to the north with the people who took me to the bears in the first time. And that's the reason why I became a cultural geographer, cultural anthropologist, to look at the situation from a different side. Um, what was, there was, uh, uh, have a I ever been... Memory. A favorite memory with a polar bear encounter. Um, a favorite memory with a polar bear encounter, and there are many of them, it's where uh, you actually 
there's no distance between or no um, fence or anything. When you see bears in the wild and they're just doing their thing, it's often from a distance. You hope you're not the prey. So you do your best not to look like a seal. Um, although when you get somebody like me dressed up in a parka, you might I may you, you might look a bit like a seal. But to be able to see bears in their in their own habitat, um, which I've seen from kayaks, canoes on the ice with snowmobiles, um, it's it's an amazing thing. They're so beautifully adapted to their environment, and they can swim like the wind. And they um, they're it's 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 an absolute. Their, their running is is incredible and it's as if the uh, the ice and the water broken up ice where they like to, to hunt is probably the most inhospitable environment and probably the scariest environment for somebody like me you know i think well can you swim in this park and well uh, the water's cold there are those bears just just going along there was a third thing there joe uh, I, I forgot <laughs> uh Oh, sorry, hit the wrong button. There we go. Let's put a pin in that because I bet you that question is going to come up again, but we'll squeak it okay. in uh, if it doesn't get answered. So I'm going to grab another classroom here. Uh, this time, let's go to with some third graders hanging out with us here in Canada. Miss Demianako's crew. Let me see if I can pop them in. Where are they hiding down here? There they are. Hey, third graders. How are we doing today? Yay! Hi. Okay, so I'm going to get my friend to come up and she'll just ask from behind the camera because we don't Perfect. have media permission. Not a problem. Nice how, and loud. How long can a polar bear live for? Yeah. How, how long can a polar bear live for, like their age? That's a great question. And uh, it's, it's about uh, a third of the time that we might expect to live. An old polar bear would be 30 years old or so. Uh, but they do live longer. They have lived uh, into their 40s. Uh, and there was a, one bear in captivity, I think, in somewhere in California that actually lived to some ridiculous age, like 47. But um, because they're a functioning predator, um, they, uh, they don't live as long. I mean, as soon as you are unable to hunt, like you get a broken jaw or you get a broken leg that stops you from doing that, that selects against you. So it's the biggest, strongest bears, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough uh, environment that they live in. Um, I was going to say one other thing about, um, about how long they live to. Oh, slipped my mind. All right. If it pops back in, don't hesitate to, to shoot it back out there. I'm going to say a quick shout out to a few classrooms on YouTube. We've got Ms. Neely's crew in Sarnia, Ontario. Ms. Dester's crew is joining us in Kansas. Ms. Moran's crew is in Sarnia as well, but uh, Mr. Parsons' crew in Ottawa, another group joining us in South Carolina. So fill that chat, put in a couple questions there, and I'll make sure that we work those in. Uh, let's visit another camera classroom this time. This time we're going to go, we've got a group joining us in North Carolina today, some second graders. I am going to bring them in. There they are. Yeah. In North Carolina. <laughs> I have a question. Okay, Kira, I have a question for us. Do polar bears change for their fur color in the summer? <laughs> what a cool question. The answer is uh, yes, because they get dirty. <laughs> when when they're when they're out, the, the fur doesn't change in color. And in fact, uh, uh, it's when they're on the ice. And they're swimming all the time. Um, and in fact, I have seen polar bears, uh, a mother and two cubs that I saw on Walrus Island at the north end of Hudson Bay one time. They had been almost inside a walrus carcass and they were both so on the land. They were they were all three of them, all red and covered with blood, but they just went swimming and, and washed it off. But in the summer, when they're on the land and can't swim as much, they kind of get... Uh, well, at the best of times, kind of golden. At the worst of times, just kind of a grotty gray color. Um, they're not very, uh, not very nice looking. But not like a hare, for example, an Arctic hare that that is uh, gets adaptive coloring for the the summer on the tundra, where they're they're kind of a dappled brownie gray color. And in the in the winter, they're pure pure white. Uh, a bear uh, is is white all the time. If you're white on the tundra, that's not what you'd call a sort of adaptive uh, coloration. It's not, 
it's the probably the worst color you could have on the tundra but happily a polar bear doesn't really have any uh any predators so so what i mean a very ambitious big arctic wolf i think would probably uh not have a go at a bear unless it was injured or they thought the bear the wolf was hunting in a pack and thought they might have a chance at uh at uh going after it but a great a great great question yeah absolutely i'm sure they were thinking about that arctic fox uh but no it's that dirty dirty land bear when it comes comes onto the shore onto the earth for a little bit very cool uh okay who should we visit now this time let us go hmm we need to drop into uh miss wrangle's crew uh let me see if i can get them in where Oh, sorry, Mrs. Willett's crew. We'll go to Mrs. Willett's class next. There we go. Hey, Mrs. Willett's class, how are we doing today? Oh, Chris. There they are. <laughs> sure. Um, how strong is a polar bear's bite? <laughs> uh, uh, really strong. <laughs> Let, let, let me let me tell you let me tell you that it's not as strong as a hyena, which is the the mammal with the uh, with the strongest jaw pressure. But if you look at the architecture of a, a hyena's head, the musculature and so on is a bit is is different. So what does a polar bear have to do with its mouth? It doesn't necessarily have to break bone. What it has to do, it needs to be able to kill a seal which they usually do with their, their paws, but they will also bite. And one of the things, I mean, we talked about the long nose, but the long nose also involves a longer jaw. And one of the ad adaptations that uh, evolution or that was selected for in the evolutionary process is these, uh, the incise of the canine teeth are actually further forward because of the longer jaw on a, um, on a polar bear and the reason for that is is it, it will do more damage on a on a seal head but most of what a polar bear does is called flensing it actually takes the fat off the uh off the the seal after it's dead and it doesn't it it needs sort of cutting as and 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 ripping teeth more so than it needs crushing teeth so that um uh, I have no idea in, in foot pounds per square inch or pounds, what kind of pressure it is. I know that it's less than a hyena. I know it's more than a budgie. But more importantly, I know that the jaw of the bear is perfectly adapted for its preferred food source. All right. Very cool. Well, there we go. We're going to sign that for a little Google homework for our classrooms to jump online afterwards and see if you can track down the pounds per square inch, uh, that bite force of a polar bear. Uh, Maybe somebody could uh, could offer their leg as the thing where the meter is going to be, Joel. You know, just and uh, if they scream really loudly, that would mean it's a really strong bite, right? Yeah, I don't think we're going to have a lot of takers, but I mean, there's adventurous folks out there, so you never know. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's jump in another crew here. Um, I. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is our crew in California, Miss Wrangle's crew. I'm going to bring them in, but they'll correct me 100% if I am wrong. Room 11, how are we doing today? Yes, we're from California. <laughs> we have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to choose one randomly. Sure. I'm going to turn this a little bit um they want to know how how fast can polar bears swim well that is another really cool question polar bears have been sighted hundreds of miles from land so how well they swim is unbelievable how fast can they swim um 12 knots which is about 15 miles an hour. And the reason I know that, because one of the first times I was actually uh, on the same ground, I told you about how much I loved watching polar bears in the wild. I was actually in a kayak, a solo kayak uh, at Wager Bay, which is high on the west side of Hudson Bay. And a polar bear dropped into the water 
more or less beside me. And I thought that bear was swimming out to eat me, of course, because I'm the center of my own universe. But it turned out he was just actually going along the shore. But I could paddle at about uh, when I'm really burning it, uh, maybe four or five knots. And here's a bear who could swim more than twice as fast as I could. So uh, I just thought it's pretty amazing. In incredibly, they can swim at that great speed using pretty much their just their powerful front feet. They're like great big paddles and their back feet are not so much used for locomotion as they're used for steering and buoyancy in the water. They're so beautifully adapted and they can do that almost exactly the same stroke. So it's sort of like the dog paddle crossed with the breast stroke. But when they're under the water, they can swim for hundreds of meters under the water as well. And they use that for hunting. But uh, it's a very cool question. But the thing that I actually dream about this, somebody asked if I'd been scared. I was scared on my wits on that day. And I, what I dream about is that I could never, ever paddle faster. <laughs> than a polar bear and that one day I'm going to have to actually try to convince a polar bear who's swimming beside me not to eat me and that's that's the dream that keeps coming back and uh, anyway I, I should talk to my uh, you know I don't know my therapist about that but I don't want to bring you into that but it's a great question another great question all right so that that third question from Miss Deacon's crew was you know a, a scary moment with polar bears and uh so I guess that might be one where you thought maybe it was coming uh coming to visit you out in that kayak and you know you weren't gonna be able to outrun it with your paddling strength all right well we visited our camera classrooms i'm going to grab a question here via youtube then we'll swing back and see if there's a couple follow-up questions so uh here's an interesting one we know that the polar bears go out onto the sea ice to hunt of course you know spring summer comes and that sea ice is lost uh they're wondering if if you've ever heard of any accounts of polar bears who maybe timed it poorly and got stranded out on the sea ice or are they pretty good at when they need to start heading back uh into shore yeah um yes they do and actually if you read ice walker that that becomes because of the way the ice is breaking up the currents in let's say hudson bay where there are several populations of those 19 um, the way the ice is melting and breaking up is different now. And one of the scenarios, I don't want to tip the hand of Ice Walker, but one of the things that the bears in that book have to contend with is that as long as they're on the ice, that's where the seals are the, and they can hunt, everything's hunky-dory. But it may be, it may come to a time, and it's they're great swimmers, but if a mother gets onto the ice in the spring with new cubs who are still growing, the mother might be able to swim the great distance to shore, which is okay, but it's the little ones you worry about. And you not only worry about them as prey for other big mammals like orcas, killer whales that are coming into their habitat as a result of disappearing ice, about them getting predated or eaten, but you also worry about them getting cold because they're just little and they don't have the fat that they need uh, to to go with. If you want to uh, figure out and follow polar bears, um, Andrew DeRoche, Dr. Andrew DeRoche at the University of Alberta has a lot of tagged polar bears and he actually is tweeting like a maniac every day. And you can actually see what the ice conditions are like. You can see where the tagged bears are. They're right now way out in the middle of Hudson Bay. And you can actually uh, ponder this question as you look at the Twitter feed of Andrew De Roche and of some of his grad students there. All right, James, what I might get you to do is uh, while we're queuing up the next question, if you want to type that name in the chat, and then I can share that via YouTube as well. Uh, and we can make sure that if the students do want to check that out, that sounds really cool to kind of track those polar bears as they're moving uh, out on the ice. So I can share, uh, if you share that in the chat, it'll come up for the camera classrooms and I'll share it on YouTube. Okay. Hey, Perfect. Uh, okay, let's see. If you have another question in your class, if you have a second question, give me a wave in your class, wave at the camera, and that'll be my cue to come back. We'll visit a few more classrooms here. Let's start here with Miss Checklist's class. Looks like they have another one. 
Tell me first. Go ahead. What's your question, Kamari? She said, I think you might have covered that one. How fast does a polar bear swim? Was our one. And then we have one more if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Landon, what was your other question? Is there um, any polar bears that um, can get over 5,000 pounds? I don't think so. I have a question. Go ahead, Cameron. Go ahead. How long can polar bears breathe underwater? He said, how long can polar bears breathe underwater? Well, they can't breathe under, the under they can't breathe underwater, but I, I understand your question. How long can they stay underwater? The answer is uh, way longer than you would think. And it's probably something like even working hard to, to make a distance because they will see a seal and they'll swim under the ice. And they can do that for probably uh, at, at least three and maybe as more, much as four or five minutes. So it's a long time for, uh, for a mammal like you and me. Yeah, definitely pretty impressive. I think the average human uh, can only hold their breath 30 to 45 seconds, which is not a very long period of time. So pretty impressive the polar bear can do that and be active while doing that too. Uh, where am I seeing some wave in? Miss Anderson's crew, go ahead. Okay. How many layers of fur do polar bears have? Um, they have really, all mammals have two types of hair. Um, and it's and they're they're combined. So there there are longer guard hairs, and then there are shorter downy hairs that are that actually have to do with not only creating a layer of air around the animal, but also serving as insulation. But it really translates to um, a dense sort of double uh, a double type of uh, of layer. Uh, but it what am I saying? It's a dense layer with two kinds of strands in it. The uh, longer hairs on a polar bear are hollow, uh, so they have air in them, what helps with flotation. It also helps with insulation. At one time, some of my colleagues at the University of Guelph actually thought that the hollow hairs of the polar bear served as a fiber optic uh, uh, cable or wire, if you like, that would bring the solar radiation, the sun's radiation down onto the polar bear's skin, which is black. Um, so it's, uh, but it, if you were to rub your hands through it, it would feel like a really uh, fuzzy dog and uh, you wouldn't really be able to, uh, to distinguish uh, between those two types of, uh, two types of hair. All right, I'm gonna get one more question in here, James. This is one more question from YouTube. This uh, group here is joining us, Ms. Cora's group. They're joining us in Ontario. They were on a camera spot, but I think their internet was a little slow. So they switched to YouTube. And they're wondering, in the summer, when the polar bears are on land, what kind of food are they looking for? What are they scavenging around for? What are they hoping to find? Uh, they're really not um, looking for, for anything. It might be as much just to keep them entertained. So they might run after a molting goose that can't fly in the summer. Um, they might dig up a uh, ground squirrel just for, for fun. Um, some of my colleagues who are studying digestion uh, suggest that a polar bear will eat kelp, which is a type of seaweed that's found on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. And what that does is it puts um, uh, a bolus or a chunk of chewed up kelp in their digestive system, which sort of keeps the, the, the pipe, pipes open, if you like, while they're in while they're they're not eating but uh the term that is used to describe their situation when they're on land is called walking hibernation meaning they're trying to use as little energy as possible for anything because they're essentially living off the fat of their winter of hunting and uh so if you were to go to the shores of Hudson Bay, say around Churchill, and this is one of the reasons why it's a huge tourist thing in the fall, the bears who have summered there are all coming back to the shore waiting uh, anxiously to get out on the ice because they're all very, very hungry at that point. But uh, they've been seen to be, uh, there was actually a, a young grad student who taught her dog to, to smell bear poo and she went around on the shore of the Arctic Ocean with her dog who found bear poo and she did analysis of that. And she actually learned that they were eating uh, eider eggs, like duck eggs, 
which is very interesting. They were actually eating little ducks uh, sometimes, anything, but it wasn't so much for nutrition because there's nothing as nutritious as, as fat when you're yeah. a polar bear and there's really no source of fat in any of those uh, those foodstuffs on the shore, they would they would probably use more energy digesting some of those things than they would get from the foodstuff it, itself. All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube classrooms. Thank you for joining us and playing along with the Kahoot. A big shout out to our camera classrooms. It's always great to see you, hear your voices, uh, and get those great questions. James, I'm going to pop up a link here. If people want to visit your website, there we go. Uh, that link's up there. Learn a little bit more about you, the work you do, the um, the books you've written. And I know you do all kinds of great stuff, like with the Peterborough Canoe Museum. And uh, you're a busy guy. So, James, it's so great to have you joining us live today, sharing some of those stories with us and, and giving us a little insight into uh, the polar bear and, uh, and, and the long nose. I would never have guessed... Uh, smell for sure, but very interesting the way it can warm up, gives that surface area to warm up that breath so it's usable. Very cool. Well, I'm glad there's this class here from Kansas, Joe, because that's where I'm headed next month to um, Springdale, Arkansas to do some work there and then to the Spencer Art Museum at the University of Kansas in, uh, in Lawrence. So uh, maybe I'll see you on the street. All right. Thanks so much, James. Classrooms, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you in a future event. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.